Hi there, welcome to the Capital Pod Citizen Silent Science. Blah, 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 blah. Hello there, welcome to the Cephalopod Citizen Science YouTube channel or Cephalopod TV or Ceph TV or Ceph TV or why do we say Ceph or Ceph? Well, I was speaking to some Greek guys who are Cephalopod researchers and they said it was with a hard C um, and they're Greek and it's a Greek word so I was kind of like, okay, let's call them Cephalopods. I mean Cephalopods, it's so confusing, isn't it? But it turns out we don't say Cetacean, do we? We say Cetacean, which my understanding is that it's also a Greek word. So there isn't any real consistency and it doesn't really matter. Cephalopods, Cephalopods. Anyway, welcome to our YouTube channel. And we have a channel because we are a citizen science project and we part of our goals is to actually share our science and the science of cephalopod research back to the public. Now there is a big scandal in the scientific process, really, the publishing of it in particular. Taxpayers pay for research and unfortunately, despite you paying for it, um, you don't get to see it. And in fact, we don't even get to see it without a charge. Universities and researchers have to pay for the papers they publish in journals, which is absolutely ridiculous. So it's very important to us at Citizen Science Project that we actually give you the research that you've paid for. Now, we could just give you the papers, we could send you emails full of PDFs, but we don't think that'd be very useful to you. So another one of our goals is, is an educational remit, and we're really excited about providing research on cephalopods to the public. And it could be on their evolution, their behavior, their physiology, um, their life histories, the fossil record, you name it, we're gonna be talking about it over the next 563 episodes, give or take. Another goal of this project is to learn a lot more, especially about the wild behavior of animals and cephalopods that we're not familiar with. What we do is we um, get observations from the citizen scientists and then we decide if they're useful or if they have something new in them. For example, we recently um, saw some really great footage of cuttlefish um, schooling or shoaling together as juveniles. And we hadn't seen this before. In fact, sociality in, in cephalopods is quite rare as it is, so it was quite exciting in its own. And we put a call out for a request for group behavior of this species, and we were inundated with evidence that supports the hypothesis that perhaps they do school or shoal as juveniles. And we're writing a paper now simply based on these wonderful observations and ideas which we never would have had without citizen scientists. So we're forever grateful for that. So why do we need a citizen science project? You may be aware that um, cephalopods have been studied a lot, but they actually focus on very, very few species. Maybe only five species, five to ten species make up a huge amount of the published research. So, for example, we're very familiar with Sepia officinalis, the cuttlefish, in the laboratory. Likewise, Octopus vulgaris, we're very, very familiar with in the laboratory as well. And we want to discover more about these animals in the wild and all of the other 798 or so species. And that's an important part of this project. One of the other really interesting areas to us at the Citizen Science Project is how cephalopods have permeated human culture. And for thousands of years, uh, literally thousands, early Greek and Roman um, ceramics were adorned by images of cuttlefish and octopuses. So you'll be familiar with the Kraken myth, and that's something we're going to explore during this series, is the idea that cephalopods have been so ingrained in human culture that they're, they're very much part of what we know about the um, animal kingdom. We'll also be dispelling quite a few misconceptions. There are a number of misconceptions about cephalopods. In particular, the idea that they came from another planet is, is complete nonsense, really. We know that they're from Earth. So how is the project made up? So we have these groups around the world, um, including all over Europe, and we encourage um, local native speakers to be the managers because we really we want to be really inclusive and we don't want English to dominate. So we want to be a community aspect, and for that we need to speak the local languages. We have a group in Japan, in Okinawa, we have a group in Mexico and in um, Central America, and we're looking to expand. And we're choosing regions where we don't tend to see many reports of cephalopods. So although the UK does have um, a large number of papers published on the cephalopods there, there's still quite a lot to learn. But what we're really interested in is regions where we don't have a lot of data. So um, South America would be a great place for us to set up groups. So if you're from South America and you're interested in helping us, get in touch and we'll find a way to make um, a project for you. So in all of the groups around the world, there's a local name 
native speaker who interacts with the system scientists, says thank you, and engages with them as much as they can. And we think this is important because uh, many of the larger system science projects, for example, iNaturalist, is fantastic and has a huge number of really useful observations, but it, what it doesn't have is a community feel to it. It's very difficult to interact with um, individuals and, and talk to scientists and so on, and we really want to um, avoid that where possible. So as a project manager, a director of the project, I answer in pretty much every post that somebody will make. It's assistant scientists that are going to make the next great discoveries probably in areas where we don't have a lot of scientists working. It will be scuba divers who make these exciting discoveries and we're keen to meet the people who are going to make these discoveries. So from these 14 groups we have around 3,500 members worldwide including the Facebook um, project page which collates all the local group um, observations and feeds them into a stream there. So we have a page as well as the multiple groups. So we have around 3,500 members worldwide. We have over 2,000 scientifically useful images or videos which are being written up into um, papers as we speak. We've got a couple of papers under review and um, some to be submitted. And we've had really rapid growth in the last three years. It's been a wonderful time. We have a, a project page on ResearchGate. If you are a scientist or familiar with ResearchGate, we have a lot of information there. We have a website. And we've achieved quite a lot in the last three years. We've uh, given lots of public talks. We've held a photographic exhibition in Mexico. And we tend to do a lot more of this public engagement stuff and we're really interested in marrying art with science because we think that's another important cultural aspect is as a scientist for many years I was admittedly quite one-dimensional it was a science, 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 science but as I've grown and matured I really started to appreciate art much much more and the art community has, loves Kefalopod so if you've got something to share with us we'd gladly give you some exposure and, and have you featured on our website etc. We're also interested in wild animal welfare and we're starting to gather data and put together um, some published research on how scuba divers interact with cephalopods. Now generally scuba divers are really really good, they're very conscientious of all animals not just cephalopods and so we don't really have an axe to grind, we don't really have any complaints to make. But that doesn't mean we can't understand our animals better when we're interacting with them and one of our uh, goals and one of our actual achievements so far is to publish ID guides in local languages and also within these ID guides is a short description of how best to interact with cephalopods. And we feel this is important because cephalopods are quite unique. They're actually terrible, terrible swimmers. So we think that if you treat cephalopods a bit differently, they'll have a better experience. They also damage very, very easily as well. And because they live sh short, fast lives, if they do damage themselves, they don't recover from it. So we're trying to avoid situations where we accidentally cause a cephalopod to damage itself. And the great thing about cephalopods is that we can actually read their signals, whether it be their body language or their um, texture or the signals they create themselves. But by learning the signals that they deploy, you can ensure that the interaction is equal, that both parties get something from it, or both parties are allowed to go their separate ways if they want to. How is the organization made up? Well, my name is Dr. Gavin Cook. I'm the director of the Citizen Science Project. Um, I created the idea in, and created the project in uh, three years ago. And since then it's really exploded and I have some wonderful volunteers who help. So I have Nefa, who's the regional manager for Mexico and also the Americas in its entirety. Um, she's doing a PhD in Ottawa in Canada. We also have Chris. Um, Chris is doing a PhD in Cambridge in the UK and he's a regional manager for Europe and also Japan as well. And Chris is a, a wonderful researcher and he's been um, with the project more or less since the beginning. We also have Haldis, who's a Norwegian fisheries expert and she manages the Scandinavian group and is doing a wonderful job. We have over 600 members in the Norwegian group alone, so that's a really exciting time for us. We also have a number of wonderful volunteers. For example, we have Paola, who's um, editing this video. Hi, Paola. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. And we also have Kim, who manages the Netherlands and the Belgium group. And we just have a real wonderful group of volunteers. But we don't always want to rely on volunteers. It's important that we are sustainable as a project, and for that we need revenue. So the research side of things, we're going to be applying for regular grants and so on to pay for the research side of things. But the educational work and the outreach work and the stuff I'm doing for you now, um, we're hoping to get paid for by um, Patreon, for example. So in the, in the link below, you'll see our 
Patreon um, project. So we're going to have a Kickstarter project for some educational materials. And also, if we get enough subscribers on YouTube, um, YouTube will start paying us a small amount to make these videos. And this is a not-for-profit organization. All the money that comes to us will go straight into um, the um, project itself. And it would be lovely to be able to start paying some of our volunteers. So what have we found so far from a scientific point of view? What have you citizen scientists um, shown us? Well, we've discovered some really exciting behavior in cuttlefish. For example, in the UK, we find that they're schooling or shoaling which has never been reported before. We also used um, social media videos to discover a new behavior in hunting in cuttlefish, and this is under review now, so we won't give too much away at the moment. We're also discovering a lot more about the habitat ecology of these animals. For example, octopuses are seen stranded quite often in European waters, and in fact, I published a few late articles trying to work out why this is the case. Why do they end up out of water when the, the tide rushes back again? We also had some amazing videos sent to us in our group in Baja California uh, in Mexico of the blanket octopus. Now the blanket octopus normally lives very very deep and we've actually had quite a few observations of them coming into shore. Now we've no idea why we're doing this but we could hypothesize and we're speculating at the moment that it's actually the end of their breeding season and they're becoming senescent so they're losing the plot a little bit. Arguably one of the most important findings that we're making at the moment is the laying of squid eggs. Now that may seem quite boring but without data like that, we can't make sensible fisheries quotas. We don't have any fishing quotas. They're just fished until presumably they go extinct. Now I work with CFAS, or the pro sorry, the project works with CFAS, which is the Centre for Environment and Fisheries in the UK government organisation. And we've given them observations of locations and times of egg laying in squid species. And we're about to submit a paper very soon, which will go some way to determine the habitat ecology and the life history of these species that are being fished um, and so by understanding their natural history, we can actually make sensible fishing quotas which are sustainable. So it would be a hugely proud moment for this project if we can publish a paper which goes towards providing fisheries quotas. It would be really, really a massive achievement for us and we're very excited about this paper being submitted next week. So that gives us an idea of the sort of work that we're doing from a research point of view. And I've also highlighted the kind of stuff that we do and when it comes to public outreach and, and education and so on. So hopefully you have a good idea about the project now and you'll stick with us and you'll subscribe and maybe even one day you'll be able to contribute whether it be part of the project yourself or a small donation towards um, some of the volunteer costs here. So thank you very much for watching and we look forward to keeping in contact. See you soon.